want to start off in a way that I usually don't. I just want to, we were flying, we were flying here from Vancouver and where we had a whole lot of people out there as well. And, and I was reading on the internet, listen to this, this is interesting. And this is what change is about. The state of Utah is one of the most conservative states in this country. They have not voted for a Democrat for president in 50 years. A poll just came out. Bernie Sanders is beating Donald Trump in Utah. us ahead in Utah by 11 points. If we can, if we're ahead in Utah by 11 points, not going to be many states in this country that we can't win. And the reason for that is that the American people are never, ever going to elect the president who insults Mexicans? Who insults Muslims? Who insults women? Who insults African Americans? Let's not forget that a few years ago, Trump was one of the leaders of the so-called Bertha Movement, which was an attempt to delegitimize the presidency of Barack Obama. American people are not going to elect someone to be president who insults our veterans. And most importantly, what the American people understand is that we are strong when we come together. That when black and white and Latino and Asian American and Native American stand together, When gay and straight and men and women stand together. That will always trump divisiveness and tearing us apart. And the American people understand that togetherness, helping each other, supporting each other will always trump selfishness. And perhaps most importantly, the American people know what every religion on earth, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, has taught us, and that is that love always trumps hatred. And if, if we stand together and we don't allow the Trumps of the world to divide us up, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Now this campaign has won in nine states. This campaign has the enthusiasm and the energy to carry us 
to victory because we are doing something very unusual in American politics. We are telling the truth. All of you know, all of you know whether it is in personal life or in political life, the truth is not always easy and it is not always pleasant. But, but if we are to go forward as a nation, we cannot sweep the major crises that we face underneath the table. We've got to address them. And that's what this campaign is doing. When we talk about the major crises, number one, every person in this beautiful arena believes passionately in democracy. One person, one vote. But as a result of this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, We now have a campaign finance system which is corrupt, which is undermining American democracy. And here is promise number one. Together, we are going to overturn Citizens United. And we are going to move toward public funding of elections. When the Koch brothers and a few of their billionaire friends are able to spend $900 million in a campaign season to elect candidates who represent the wealthy and the powerful, that is not democracy, that is oligarchy. We do not accept that. But it is not just, not just the corrupt campaign finance system which is undermining our democracy. We have Republican governors all over this country who are working overtime to suppress the vote. They're trying to make it harder for African Americans, for poor people, for old people, for students to participate in the political process. And I say to those governors, if you don't have the guts to run in a free and fair election, get another job, get out of politics. <laughs> democracy, democracy is one person, one vote and a Sanders Department of Justice will challenge every one of these cowardly Republican government governors. I want this country to have one of the highest voter turnouts in the world, not one of the lowest. We're going to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. <laughs> but it's not only a corrupt campaign finance system, it is also a rigged economy that we are going to address. <laughs> Let me tell you what a rigged economy is. A rigged economy is when the top 
one-tenth of one percent now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. A rigged economy is when the 20 wealthiest people own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans, half of our country. A rigged economy is when one family, the Walton family of Walmart, owns more wealth, owns more wealth than the bottom 40% of our people. And what the rigged economy is about is this one family, the wealthiest family in America, paying wages that are so low that many of their employees are forced to go on Medicaid, food stamps, and subsidized housing. And a rigged economy is when the working people of this country have to pay taxes to subsidize the operations of the wealthiest family in America. So I say to the Walton family, get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. The middle class should not have to subsidize the richest family in America. But it's not just wealth and the grotesque distribution of wealth. It is what is happening every single day. In America today, you have millions of people working longer hours for lower wages. Do you know why people are angry? because the male worker in the middle of the economy today in real inflation dollars is making 700 bucks less than he would have made 43 years ago. And the woman worker is making $1,000 less than she made in seven years ago. What we are seeing in America today is mothers out working incredibly long hours, fathers out working, kids are out working, marriages are being stressed out, parents don't have the time to spend with their kids. And meanwhile, 58% of all new income is going to the top 1%. That is a rigged economy. We are going to change that. We are going to create an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Yeah. We are going to change an economy in which we have today, shamefully, the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth at the same time as we are seeing a proliferation of billionaires. That is not what this country is supposed to be about. And not only are we going to deal with a corrupt campaign finance system and with a rigged economy? We are going to deal with a broken criminal justice system. What this campaign is about is urging the American people to think outside of the box, to look at the status quo, not as it has to be, but in ways that we can change it. The, re 
The reality that we are experiencing today is not the reality that we have to have. The options, the policy options that the corporate media give us are not the only options that we have. So when we think about the status quo, ask yourselves, how does it happen that in this country, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we have more people in jail than any other country on Earth? Think about it. Think about it. China is a communist authoritarian country. They don't tolerate dissent all that much. And yet we have more people in jail than China, which is four times our size. So here's what I think together we have got to do. We have got to recognize that youth unemployment in this country is off the charts that for white kids who graduated high school, real unemployment, 33%, Latino kids, 36%, African American kids, 51%. So what we are going to do is invest in jobs and education, not jails and incarceration. Forty, forty years ago, we once had the best educated population in the world. We can be that people again. We don't have to have kids hanging out on street corners. They can be in school and in decent paying jobs. And when we talk about a broken criminal justice system, you and I and everyone else in this country are tired of seeing videos of unarmed people, often African Americans, shot by the police. I am a former mayor. I have worked with police departments in my own state of Vermont, and I've worked with police all over this country. The vast majority of police officers are honest, hardworking, and they have a really hard job. But like any other public official, when a police officer breaks the law, that officer must be held accountable. We have got to demilitarize our police departments. We have got to make local police departments reflect the diversity of the communities that they serve. We have got to take a hard look at the failed war on drugs. There are millions of Americans over the last 30 years who have received police records for possession of marijuana. Right now, the Federal Controlled Substance Act has marijuana as a Schedule I drug, alongside of heroin. Every person here knows that heroin is a killer drug. 
And while people may debate the pluses and minuses of marijuana, it ain't heroin, that's for sure. And that is why I have introduced legislation to take marijuana out of the Federal Controlled Substance Act. States, as you know, have the right to legalize marijuana. Four states have done that. But in my view, possession of marijuana should not be a federal crime. And when we talk about drugs, let me simply say that in my state of Vermont, neighboring New Hampshire, and states all over this country, we have a major crisis in drug addiction, in heroin addiction, in opiate addiction. People die every day from overdoses. In my view, we need to treat drug addiction as a health issue, not a criminal issue. And what that means, and what that means, and again, this is thinking big and outside of the box. It means that we need a revolution in mental health treatment in this country. People should be able to get the treatment they need when they need it, not six months from now. This campaign is doing well because we are listening to the people of this country, not just wealthy campaign contributors. We are listening to workers all over this country who are telling us they cannot make it on nine or 10 bucks an hour. And that is why we have to do nationally what Seattle has already done. Raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. And Seattle, thank you very much for leading the country in that direction. Now, what a political revolution is about is not listening to what the media thinks is important. It is listening to what your own hearts and minds know to be important. And it doesn't matter whether the media talks about it or not, but the truth is there are millions of senior citizens and disabled veterans in this country trying to make it on 11 or $12,000 a year Social Security. And you know what? Nobody can make it on 11 or $12,000 a year Social Security. Unbelievably, my Republican colleagues in the Congress, and this is just hard to believe, they want to cut Social Security benefits. Well, I've got some very bad news for them. We're not going to cut Social Security benefits. We're going to expand Social Security benefits.
This campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the Latino community. And what they are saying is there is 11 million undocumented people in this country. Many of them are living under the, in the shadows. They're living in fear. They are being exploited every day. And what our Latino brothers and sisters are telling us is they need and want, and I agree with them, comprehensive immigration reform. And a path toward citizenship. And we will not accept for one moment the bigotry and the xenophobia of people like Donald Trump who are using Mexicans as scapegoats. And if the Congress does not do its job and pass comprehensive immigration reform, I will use the executive powers of the presidency to do everything I can. Our immigration policy has got to be uniting families, not dividing families. Our campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the African-American community. And they are asking me, how does it happen that we can spend trillions of dollars on a disastrous war in Iraq but not invest in inner cities throughout this country? How does it happen that millions of African-American children are going to schools that are totally inadequate? How does it happen that our jails are full of young African-Americans? How does it happen that in this country we allow to occur situations like exists in Flint, Michigan, where children are being poisoned. Instead of giving tax breaks to billionaires, we're going to rebuild inner cities all over this country. This campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the Native American community. And actually, just before I came up here, I had the privilege of meeting with some tribal leaders here from the state of Washington. And I do not have to explain to anybody in this room that the way we have treated the first Americans from day one, from before this nation became a nation, has been absolutely disgraceful. Native Americans have been lied to, they have been cheated, Treaties negotiated have been broken. We owe the Native American people an enormous debt of gratitude that we can never repay.
We have learned, we have learned an enormous amount from their culture and perhaps more than any other people, they have taught us the need to respect our environment. They have taught us how important it is to live with nature, not destroy nature. And if elected president, we will change the relationship of the United States government to the sovereign Native American tribes. This campaign, this campaign is listening to our young people. And what our young people are saying, how does it happen that despite an explosion of technology and worker productivity, the youth generation today, if we do not change it, will be the first generation in modern history to have a lower standard of living than their parents. That's right. That is the American dream in reverse. Historically, what America has always been about is parents who did not have a lot of money, and that's my parents and millions of other families, worked hard for the dream that their kids would do better than them. And we together will not destroy that American dream. And young people are asking me, they say, Bernie, everybody told us how important it was for us to get the best education that we could. How important it was for our lives and for our country where we are competing in a very competitive global economy. How does it happen that when we do what we were asked to do, we leave school $30,000, $50,000 in debt? Again, I ask you, think outside of the box, outside of status Quo. Ask yourselves why it is that millions of people in this country are being punished with outrageous debt decade after decade for what? For getting an education? That's crazy. That is not only unfair to those millions of young people who will be saddled with that. I've talked to people paying 50% of their income back in student debt, paying debt off decade after decade. We have got to do two things in my view. Number one, recognize that the people who fought for free public education 100 years ago were incredibly prescient and what they did was right, but the world has changed, the economy has changed, technology has changed, education has changed. Today, in many respects, a college degree is the equivalent of what a high school degree was 50 years ago. Fifty years ago, you had a high school degree. You were in pretty good shape. You can go out and get a good paying job. But that world has changed. And that is why I believe that when we talk about public education today, we must talk about tuition-free public colleges and universities.
This is not a radical idea. This idea exists in Germany today. It exists in Scandinavia today. You know, I was at a meeting in D.C. It was a meeting, uh, and we were talking about higher education, and I mentioned that in Scandinavia, uh, college is free. And some guy jumped up, and he said, no, uh, Senator Sanders, I come from Finland. Uh, it's not free. They pay us to go to college. So what we have got to recognize is our young people are the future of this country. They need the best education they can get, and they should not have to sacrifice their economic future to get that education. Second of all, right now, in America, Millions of people are struggling with outrageously high levels of student debt today. What I believe is that we must give those people the opportunity to refinance that student debt at the lowest interest rates they can find. Now, here is thinking outside of the box, thinking about what is quote unquote realistic, what quote unquote we can do. All of you know back in 2008, as a result of the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior of Wall Street, this country was driven into the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. And Wall Street, that had spent billions of dollars to get deregulated, came to Congress and they said, please, please bail us out. And against my vote, Congress did bail them out. Okay. Well, I happen to believe that today it is time to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. a tax that would more bring in more than enough revenue to make public colleges and universities tuition-free and significantly reduce student debt. If Congress can bail out the crooks on Wall Street, now is the time for them to help the middle class of this country. I am a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment. I have talked to scientists all over the world. The debate is over. Climate change is real. Climate change is caused by human activity. Climate change is already doing devastating harm to our country and countries all over the world. That's the fact. In my view, we have a moral responsibility to leave this planet to our children and grandchildren in a way that is healthy and habitable. And that means, that means that we have got to tell the fossil fuel industry that the future of this planet is more important than their short-term profits. And that means, that means that the United States has got to lead the world working with China, working with Russia, working with India, in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy.
And it is a rather amazing and pathetic thing that we have every Republican candidate for president, as you remember, there are quite a lot of them. <laughs> every one of them refused to acknowledge what science is telling us. And that is scary stuff because you cannot run a government or make policy decisions if you reject science. And let me tell you why, let me tell you why Republicans refuse to acknowledge the reality and the danger of climate change. And that is that if they came before you, one of these candidates came before you and said, you know, climate change is real, we've got to do something about it, on that day, they would lose their campaign funding from the Koch brothers and the fossil fuel industry. So I say to the Republicans, think about future generations, worry about them, and not your damn campaign fundraising. Now, while we are on, while we're on the subject of Republicans, <laughs> let me mention that Republicans go all over this country talking about family values. They just love families. But I want everybody here to know what they mean by family values. What they mean is no woman in this arena, in this state, in this country, should have the right to control her own body. I disagree. You know, you know, I will not shock anybody here to tell you that in politics today there is a lot of hypocrisy. But on this issue, the hypocrisy stinks to high heaven. And that is because, I'll tell you what it is. Republicans, you know, tell us every day, government is the enemy, we hate government, we want to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the EPA, government is terrible, government is awful, get government off of our backs, except, <laughs> except when a woman has to make a very personal choice. In that, then, then they love government and they want the federal government and the state government and the local government to tell every woman in America what she should do with her own body. And when Republicans talk about family values, what they mean is that our gay brothers and sisters should not have the right to be married. I disagree. Now, thinking outside of the box, thinking beyond where CNN and CBS and ABC want you to think. Ask yourself this question. How does it happen that every major country on Earth, Germany, France, the UK, Holland, Scandinavia, Italy, Canada, every country guarantees health care to all of their people? Now, I have been criticized for saying this, so I will say it again. I believe that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. Now, I 
am on the committee that helped write the Affordable Care Act, and the ACA has done a lot of good things. We have done away with this obscenity of pre-existing conditions. 17 million Americans now have some health insurance who previously did not. We have ended discrimination against women who are paying higher premiums because they were women. But while we have made progress, it is clear to me, and I think most Americans, that much more needs to be done. Despite the Affordable Care Act, 29 million Americans have no health insurance. Many of you are underinsured with high deductibles and copayments. And the drug companies are ripping us off in an unconscionable way. We pay, we pay by far, not even close, the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. People in America are dying because they cannot afford the drugs they need. And then on top of everything, we are spending way, way more than any other country per capita on health care, almost three times more than the British, who provide health care to all of their people, 50% more than the French, much more than the Canadians. In my view, the time is long overdue for this country to move toward a Medicare for all single-payer program. Now, everybody here understands one very important historical principle, and that is in the history of our country, change has never taken place from the top on down. It is always from the bottom on up. Corporations and employers never gave permission for workers to form unions. Workers fought for those union rights. For a very long time, millions of African Americans and their white allies at the grassroots level stood and fought and were beaten and went to jail and sometimes died to say that in America racism and bigotry and segregation are not acceptable. A hundred years ago, not a long period of time from an historical perspective, a hundred years ago, women in America did not have the right to vote, could not go to the schools they wanted, could not do the work they wanted 100 years ago. But women, women and their male allies stood together and women went on hunger strikes. They went to jail. Some died to say that in America, women will not be treated as second-class citizens. If we were in this arena all of 10 years ago, no time at all, and somebody jumped up and said, you know, I think that in the year 2015, 
gay marriage will be legal in every state in this country. The person next to him would have said, what are you smoking? You are nuts. Can't happen. But what happened is in the face of enormous hatred and bigotry and opposition, the gay community and their straight allies said year after year, decade after decade, that in America, people have the right to love whoever they want, regardless of their gender. And that is how change always takes place. It takes place when people look around them and say the status quo is not acceptable. Racism is not acceptable. Sexism is not acceptable. Homophobia is not acceptable. And today, I believe that we are at that moment in our history where the status quo simply is not acceptable. And if you go beyond the corporate media and their sense of reality, and you look around and you say, no, why should we have more income and wealth inequality than any other major country on earth? Not acceptable. Why should we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any nation on earth? Not acceptable. Why should people in America have to work two or three jobs to bring in enough income and health care. Not acceptable. Why are billionaires able to buy elections? Not acceptable. Why are we the only major country not to guarantee health care and paid family and medical leave to all of our people? Not acceptable. What this campaign is about is redefining who we are as a people. What this campaign is about is rejecting establishment politics, establishment economics. What this campaign is about is the understanding that if millions of people, many of whom have given up on the political process, working people who are disgusted with what goes on in Washington, young people who have never voted in their lives. If we come together and we do not allow the Trumps and others of the world to divide us up, if we demand that we have a government that represents all of us and not just a handful of wealthy campaign contributors, There is nothing that we cannot accomplish. That's what this campaign is about. And that is what the political revolution is about. It is telling, it is about telling the billionaire class and their super PACs 
and Wall Street and corporate America and the corporate media that they cannot have it all. Next Saturday at 9 o'clock. <laughs> See, it looks like you already know about the caucuses. You know, the big money interests, quite truly, do not want people to participate in the political process. They understand that if few working people don't vote and young people don't vote, the big money interest will always win. Well, next Saturday, let's give them a miserable day. Let us, let us have a record-breaking turnout here in Washington. And if we do, we're going to win, and Washington will help make the political revolution. Thank you all very much. <laughs>